Welcome to Scripture and Tradition. I'm Father Mitch Paqua, and this is a program where we take a look at sacred Scripture, the Word of God, and we try to understand it more deeply, especially using the great gift of apostolic tradition. That is the background that goes from what our Lord taught the apostles by word of mouth, and they passed on to their disciples by word of mouth. Now, we'd love to have you be part of our program. You can do that during the live program, which is on Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. You can do that by calling in. The number, if you are in North America, is 1-800-221-9460. 1-800-221-9460. Or if you are outside North America, you can call country code 1, area code 205, 271 2980. 205-271-2980. Or send us questions via email, writing to scripture and tradition at ewtn.com. Or you can also follow us and participate with the show on YouTube. Today we will begin a journey into the Garden of Gethsemane to try and understand the role of the sufferings of Christ and his disciples and a suffering that is so important that it was a crucial prophecy in Isaiah chapter 53. And we will see it fulfilled not only in Gethsemane, but also throughout the rest of the passion of Christ, his suffering and death. Now, we are going through my book, Wheat and Tares, Restoring a Moral Vision of a Scandalized Church. And you can get this at EWTN's Religious Catalog. Simply go to EWTNRC.com, where it is item number 81098. And today, uh, we are beginning our discussion on page 77, which is the opening of chapter 4, which is about Gethsemane, betrayal, and abandonment. So let's take a look at that. First, I started off mentioning Isaiah 53. This is a section of Isaiah that in the Roman Catholic Rite, we read every Good Friday. It is one of the best ways to understand the suffering of Christ as predicted. Um, and it also helps us understand that Christ's suffering is not some accident, some, something that happens by happen chance or some other thing like that. No, it has purpose. It was predicted. And we need to understand the meaning of his suffering because that is a way to understand the meaning of our suffering. Life is hard, and suffering is inevitable in this life, but it's not meaningless or purposeless, and that's what we need to understand. Let's begin with Isaiah chapter 53, verses 3 to 5. It says, of the servant of the Lord, and I quote, he was despised, and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hid, hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole. And with his stripes, we are healed. There's a lot of richness in this for us to contemplate. Isaiah wrote this somewhere around uh, four 
uh, excuse me, 540 BC. So about this belongs to uh, about the year 540 BC, give or take a year or two. And he talked about this servant of the Lord. There, this is the fourth section of Isaiah that deals with the servant of the Lord in 42 and 49, 50, and now 53. And these are oftentimes called the song of the servant of the Lord. There's four songs of these. And in this, the one that we read today in Isaiah 53, he predicts that the servant of the Lord will heal humanity, not in spite of their suffering, but in the midst of their suffering that this is very much a part of the ministry of Jesus, and the New Testament makes this clear. Now, we see this passage quoted in the New Testament a couple times. For instance, I, uh, I, excuse me, Matthew chapter 8, verse 17, wrote about the healings of Jesus that this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our infirmities and bore our diseases. Now, Matthew is explaining the healings that Jesus did with Isaiah 53, verse 4. We also see later on in uh, an epistle that uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, that in... Uh, St. Peter's first epistle, he wrote, Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. This is Isaiah 53, verse 5, that he's quoting there. And we also, if you look in Acts of the Apostles, the uh, Ethiopian eunuch is reading from Isaiah 53. And he doesn't understand who it's talking about. And so St. Philip the deacon explains it to him and he baptizes the man. So there are a few, these three times that Isaiah 53 is cited. Now our faith... In, uh, and through the perspective of Isaiah 53 is something that helps us understand why in the New Testament the longest episodes, the longest stories in the Gospels are the representations of Christ's suffering and death from Gethsemane through the burial of Jesus is always the longest episode of the New Testament. And you can subdivide it up, but it's basically one long event that goes from Holy Thursday night all the way through the burial on Good Friday. So it just takes a day. But it's very long. And they bring out so many details of Christ's suffering and death because they understand he was fulfilling this prophecy in Isaiah 53. And again, on one hand, like all of humanity, our Lord Jesus suffers. And yet he does something that is way more than just an example of heroism. He's not just... Some here, a lot, of, a lot of the Greeks would talk about stories of heroic suffering. And the Romans would do that in their histories. They talk about people who were tortured and suffered, but refused to betray Rome or the army. And these are great heroes of theirs. And you can read a lot of those stories in Livy and other uh, Roman historians. But our Lord is not about heroic example. It's rather that there is actually power in his suffering. And this is something that we have to see 
that we can connect our own suffering with his and that we can join with him in our suffering. And this is a very important point. Um, first of all, we see in the Gospels, uh, before Gethsemane, during the public ministry, a number of times, our Lord Jesus talks about the necessity of his disciples, his Christian followers, to suffer with him. Take a look at Luke chapter 14, verse 27. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. If you're not willing to take up the cross and follow Jesus, you cannot be his disciple. Also in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, he said to everybody, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. This is a very important command that our Lord Jesus gives us. And this flat contradicts what some people try to say, well, Jesus died on the cross and he took all the suffering for us so we don't suffer on earth. That's not what our Lord Jesus taught. That's not in the gospel. They are making that up. In fact, if we go over to St. Paul, uh, and we can see in Galatians chapter 5, verse 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And in this, you know, what he means by the flesh are those elements of our disordered desires. As I often put it, the way that most of us want a lot more ice cream than we want broccoli, cauliflower, and Brussels sprouts. Okay, so that's, that's part of the reality of the disorder. And that gets put to death. Some of those disordered desires are not just about taste of food. It's about seeking things for our selfish purposes at the expense of other people. This is often true when people are using drugs and getting caught up in sexual misconduct. All of that is, is part of the flesh. And we have to die to ourselves in the flesh. And St. Paul goes on to say a little bit later in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, but far be it from me to glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world, that I cannot put worldly concerns ahead of Christ or ahead of my salvation. Worldly concerns, a desire for a name, for money, for power, and all this other nonsense, that will all fade away. And if you don't believe me, ask yourself, who was the king of England in 1150? <laughs> Most of us don't know. He, he thought himself pretty important. But none of us remember him anymore. Whereas the saints of that time are remembered. Thomas a Becket is still celebrated. And this is where we have to put our worldly desires in context and let that be crucified along with our own flesh. And we also take a look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, Arm yourselves with the same thought, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Because there is a certain amount of suffering in giving up the desires of the flesh. 
And a lot of times we'd like to gratify the desires of the flesh. And that's not what we're called to do. So, based on these teachings of Jesus Christ and of his disciples, we, that you know, we have to follow Christ by picking up our cross and following him. This is something that we should find the power of his grace and meaning and purpose in the sufferings of Christ. We need to understand what it's about. And we can also find meaning in our own pain. And this is trying to understand the meaning of suffering, whether it's from the accidents that occur in life, as often happen. Look at the hurricanes and that terrible fire in Hawaii. Or the suffering that is caused when people choose to do evil, in particular doing evil to us or other human beings. That that choice to do evil is something that causes pain. And we can find meaning in either willful suffering imposed upon us or the accidents of history or the pain that's caused by our own stupidities. You know, don't forget that part either. I try not to. So uh, this is something that we can do. Now, does that mean that we should say, okay, I'll help to increase pain? No, we should help to reduce pain. That's why it's good to do medical research and be doctors and nurses and clever people who figure out how to farm better to end hunger and nakedness and all this. We should do that. Uh, try to, you know, reduce the suffering from hunger, sickness, natural catastrophes, all this, um, as well as try to eliminate the injustice that causes suffering and pain because people are doing bad things to us. But throughout this life, there still is going to be suffering that will only end in heaven. That's when it comes to an end. And if you have to endure pain and agony, uh, you can find meaning in it, and you can find power. There is a great source of power in our suffering. And we do that by considering, meditating upon the suffering of Jesus Christ in Gethsemane, the house of the high priests, Annas and Caiaphas, the Sanhedrin, the court of Pilate, and, of course, Calvary itself. So all of this is when we look at Jesus in faith and we begin to understand the meaning of suffering for ourselves. And this is such a powerful component that St. Paul wrote this about it in Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. Remember, he wrote this while he's in prison. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body that is the church. This is a powerful teaching that St. Paul gives us. And it goes flat against anyone that would say, well, the sufferings of Christ are complete. St. Paul tells us that his sufferings are working toward completing it, but the sufferings of all Christians are part of it. Why is that? Because we are members of Christ. We are baptized into Christ, and by being united with him by the Holy Spirit in baptism, we are members of his body, and as members of his body, we complete what is lacking in his sufferings. It's not irrelevant. And it has purpose because it serves to help the whole church. That he suffer, Paul says he suffers for the sake of Christ's body, the church. As a member of the body, he suffers for the whole body. The way one part of you might get an infection and 
gets all red and stuff, but that's where the white blood cells, or the red blood cells are killing off the bacteria and such. The white blood cells are uh, working to kill off the bacteria. Many of them die, but they help us become free of the infection. So this is one of the things that we all seek to do as members of the body of Christ. We're going to take a break, we'll come back in a couple of minutes, and uh, we'll continue on with this introduction to what our Lord did in Gethsemane. So please stay with us. Welcome back. So we've been going through some of these passages where our Lord Jesus tells us that we have to pick up our cross and follow him. St. Paul talks about being crucified you know, to our own flesh and giving up the desires of the flesh and being crucified to the world so that we don't follow the world or the flesh. St. Peter had said the same thing in his first epistle. And St. Paul talked about, you know, that our sufferings, you know, make up for what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ as members of the body of Christ and for the sake of the church. Now, I'd like to apply this background to the main theme of this book. You know, again, I wrote this book as a way to help us understand and pray through the terrible scandal that has been caused in the church by the priests' abuses, especially of young people. And, you know, this is a terrible scandal in which a few, sometimes small children, most of the victims were adolescents, some were various adults, um, and all of whom were abused by members of the clergy. About 3% of the American clergy were involved in that abuse. And though it's a small percentage, uh, it was still 11,000 people who were harmed by this. And that's a lot. And it's, And I've said before, it's in the context of you know, abuse going on throughout our society. You know, the famous survey and study by Cheryl, Dr. Cheryl Shakespeare for the Department of Education showed that just in the 1990s, 290,000 children had been sexually abused in public schools just in the 1990s. So and it's, it's spread farther and wider than that. The people who've gone through this, especially these young people who've gone through it, they have suffered for a lot of years. A lot of times because they're young, they can't talk about it right away. It's, it's too overwhelming, too, too much of a shock to their own system. Their wounds are very deep. And even when the young person uh, and this happens across society. Some, there are some young people, not, you know, I don't know the percentages, but some have initiated this behavior. Now, the adults involved, whether clergy, uh, step parents, or teachers, and so on, no matter where they are, the adults st still need to be the ones to say no to this. They have that responsibility. And even, but even when the kids take the initiative for such behavior, there are still very deep wounds for entering into a realm of life that is you know, beyond their comprehension. You know, 
human relationship and sexuality within that relationship is something very deep, very rich, but also can be very painful when it is done in the context of self-centeredness by anybody's part. And these wounds just don't go away by themselves. It's not that it's, oh, it'll be okay. No, no, I've even heard people on radio saying, well, if a woman teacher in, you know, has uh, an abusive relationship with a young adolescent boy, you know, he'll get over it, it's no big deal. It is a big deal. It affects his ability to relate to women his own age especially once he gets into his 20s. That's been one of the results that's gone on. And so these are very important wounds, and they don't leave scar tissue on the skin. They don't leave broken bones. Um, but something we can learn from those regular human experiences you know, most human beings get some cuts or scratches, and sometimes a, a, a cut, well, it'll heal, and it leaves a scar, but oftentimes the scar tissue is even stronger than the original skin. And as happens often to lots of people, if not most, people break bones. You know, they get a broken bone here or there. And it always leaves uh, its mark on the bone. And archaeologists can tell who had broken bones. But they also heal. They heal up. And when a broken bone heals, it heals stronger than it was in that spot originally. And this is perhaps an image for what we can expect to happen with the emotional and spiritual healings that take place. Yes, the, the damage is real and the scars are profound, but we can also see that the suffering can help bring about a new kind of strengthening. And what had been you know, a, a, a source of tremendous pain can become an area of great healing. So this is something that we seek and seek with Christ to help them cope with life itself, to learn to deal with the anger and, and at the betrayal that they experience, because that's what abuse of young people is. It's a betrayal of trust as well as the other elements of pain. And this is something that people can look at their own pain and sort of do their own biography of suffering. And the goal of this book is to help them see their biography through the lens of the sufferings of Jesus Christ. They can find themselves in so many ways in what Christ has suffered. It's not where everything is happy, happy, happy. Yeah, people go through a lot of pain, won't find the happy, happy part. They need to engage and meet Christ in the valley of the shadow of death. They need to encounter him in the midst of their difficulties. And we do this with a double hope. First, that they can experience Christ meeting their suffering with his and encountering somebody who understands you more profoundly than anybody else can. Christ in his suffering can enter into your experience in the way that only a fellow sufferer can. That's one very important element. But also, we can see that the healing that our Savior Jesus gives will help the healed person to become a healer. 
that the person who starts to experience a new strengthening will be able, better than most, to help other people suffering similar difficulties. There's a resonance, a, a depth of comprehension that happens when one sufferer encounters another. And this is a, a very important thing. And they can also learn to help the various medical doctors and psychologists and counselors who have a real role in the healing process, but there is another kind of healing process that goes on. And this is something that healed you know, victims of abuse can bring to others. Uh, there, there was a famous book by Henri um, uh, Nouwen called The Wounded Healer. And it's partly about folks who help others recognizing their own pain and not being embarrassed or ashamed of it, but rather to understand that this is part of the healing process as well and that that's rooted in the power that Isaiah the prophet had said, that by Jesus' stripes, by his wounds, we are healed. And that those who are willing to understand their own woundedness can also find a source of healing others with similar wounds. Okay, So that's what we want to approach. Next week, we'll start uh, looking at what happened in Gethsemane. Uh, so look forward to continuing on uh, through the next three chapters of my book, just dealing with Christ's sufferings as related to the sufferings of victims of sex abuse, but also victims of so many other issues as well, divorce and abandonment, lots of things. So this would be something many of us can find help from. All right, let us go to some of your questions. I have a question here in our studio audience. What can we do for you? So I was wondering, why do most Catholics receive on the tongue at communion? And was that something that happened at the Last Supper? Okay. Um, we don't know. Uh, no, no mention is made about how they received Holy Communion at the Last Supper. And uh, it doesn't say if they received it in their hands or if Jesus placed it on the tongue. Nothing is said. So you can't argue from silence one way or the other. Um, but, you know, one, uh, the, the idea of most Catholics receiving Holy Communion on the tongue in the present time, um, that is something that is a change. Um, there was a period in, um, you know, when most people started to receive in the hand, and in some places they still do. We have that option. We definitely have that option. And this is uh, something that people can choose either one, but I do see in some areas more and more people choosing to receive on the tongue. Now, in some parts of the church, for instance, in the Maronite rite and the Byzantine rites, it's not allowed to receive Holy Communion in the hand uh, because you see the body and blood together. The, uh, the body of Christ is in the blood of Christ and is given by spoon in the Byzantine rite, so I can't receive it in the hand. And then in the Maronite rite, it, the body of Christ is dipped into the precious blood and given to on the tongue. But in the Roman rite, there, uh, in the United States anyway, there's an indult to allow either way. Uh, but it does seem that many people are moving uh, back to a re receiving on the tongue because they find that more of a... Um, 
way to honor Christ. It's more respectful. And that's what they're trying to do, be more respectful. Some people find it more respectful to receive in their hand. And this is an option. Uh, you know, the issue at stake, though, is showing respect for Christ and the Blessed Sacrament and not letting him, whether you receive in the hand or uh, in the mouth, that you don't take him for granted. Let me keep. We have a caller online. Hello, William? Yes. Yeah, you're calling from Texas. What part of Texas? Waco, Central Texas. I know Waco pretty well. Uh, <laughs> if anybody's traveling through there, make sure you stop for the Kalachis. So, yes. Oh, that's in West, just uh, 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 about uh, seven, 18 miles where I'm at north on I-35. That's close enough for country music. Yeah, I was so, born in Temple, Texas, which is south, but anyway. Yep. What can we do for you, William? Uh, well, I was I was molested when I was four years old, five, by my brother. Then I was molested by the neighbor across the street when I was nine, uh, just after I had given my life to the Lord and became a Christian at Emmanuel Baptist Church in Temple, mm -hmm. Texas, at a revival. And then in the Air Force, when I was doing a remote assignment, over in Turkey by um, a guide for the chaplain services tour. Anyway, the, what you said earlier about it affecting me, and it affects people's lives on and on and on and over and over. I'm 64 years old now. Um, I know I've been forgiven, and I'm not digging it up for that. Where does someone go to get help? I mean, my church is wonderful about doing Bible studies and group mm -hmm. meetings and, mm -hmm. and garage sales and festivals. But who can you talk to? How do you approach them? Yeah. William, I'm going to make a couple suggestions. Uh, you know, there are a, a good number today of Christian psychology counselors. And... Here's here's the way that William, do you hunt? I used to, but now I can't walk hardly. Oh, of my okay. Back. Well, you know, if you ever hunted with dogs, yeah, I've, the, I've hunted with dogs. I've hunted yeah. with bird dogs. You know, it, I've, I've well, let's take a. I just want to focus on bird dogs. That a psychologist is like a good bird dog. That he is able to go you know, through conversation with you up and down, trying to spot where some of the problems are, the way a dog will go and, you know, smell out a bird and then point. And that's what a good psychologist can do, is help to go through various areas of your mind because it's very complex. Human sexuality and relationships are very complex. And in the, the best of situations, it has difficulties. So the psychologist can help you to go in there and find where the difficulties are. And they, a good psychologist can help to flush out the complex issues. Instances of, say, I wanted to please people, but they wanted to abuse me, and I recognized it too late, and a variety of other things. That will be a help to you. And I don't know what's available in Waco, but uh, I, I know that that's a big enough town that there are going to be some, especially with Baylor being you know, in the city and all, they may know where there's a good Christian counselor to help you sort through that. Secondly, though, the psychologist is not the hunter that brings the bird down. That's where Christ has to come in. And uh, I'm going to recommend, you know, I recommend this book. I wrote this book. I don't make any money off it. I'm not doing this to promote anything that helps me because uh, I don't. That's, I don't make anything from it. But... I wrote it to help you to go into the gospel stories of our Lord's suffering and to start to say, wait a minute, 
I can see where the way that Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss, these other people betrayed me, that they were abusing me, but and because it was a betrayal. And then you meet with Christ. You, you use your imagination to what would it be like as Judas comes up and kisses Christ in order to be a sign of betrayal and to put yourself into the way Christ would, would be feeling at that moment and to begin to find yourself there. That's going to be a key part of the healing. You don't ignore the psychologist. Again, they're helpful like a good bird dog. But Christ is going to be the one that goes into the heart of it, and he will be the one that brings you healing. That's, so it's not just studying about the word, but it's meeting Jesus in the midst of his pain and bringing your pain with him. That's where you meet him in the midst of that difficulty. Thank you very much for calling, William. That was, uh, I'm sure, not easy, but I, I appreciate you. You make a good illustration of what we need to all do in finding healing. I have to take a little break. We'll be back with more of your questions and comments, so please stay with us. First, I want to invite you to join me tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time for EWTN Live. I'll be speaking with author and retreat leader Carl A. Schultz about ways to continue to encourage Catholics about the importance of biblical literacy and how all aspects of the faith are deeply rooted in God's holy word and how we need to be familiar with that word, okay? So it'll be a good conversation. Let's now go to Michelle, who is in the great state of Florida. Michelle. Hi, Father Pacwa. How are you? Fine. Were you hurt by the hurricane? Oh, uh, we were hurt last year by Ian, and it hasn't even been one year, but it was very bad here, and... Our county, Lee County, was hit the worst. We didn't have mass at our church in Fort Myers for about a month. And then the, the trees that came down and uh, Sanibel, I know you've been over here because I yes. think you gave a talk over at uh, one of the Catholic universities in Naples. Right. They right. asked you to Bobby go. Maria. Uh, yeah. Good. And uh, but Naples was not hit as bad as we were. We were hit Lee County, Fort Myers, Cape Coral, Matt Lachey. Mm -hmm. They were all hit terribly. And those, it's going to take years, years to come back. And this is and, uh, a, a good thing for all of us to remember how difficult it is. And I know many people have volunteered to go down and help people. So many people have lost everything, uh, their possessions, and a few lives have been lost, even more importantly. So, so many. if okay. you have, have a good chance to uh, try and help folks. But Michelle, what can we do for you today? What was your question? The question I have, Father Mitch, is I, I live in Fort Myers, but my daughter and my son and daughter-in-law and their 10-year-old live in Cape Coral, which is just over the bridge. But mm -hmm. uh, she goes to Catholic school in the 10th and mm -hmm. the 5th grade, 10 uh -huh. years old. And uh, she has, they're very, she's a very uh, caring child. Mm -hmm. And her one very good friend is in the other classroom, not the same sh classroom she's in. But her friend told her 
that uh, their their priests at uh, at their church are young priests. They're not like sixty or seventy like at my church. Uh-huh. They're like. 30, 25, 30 years old, Mm -hmm. they told the whole class of 10-year-olds that if they don't go to Mass on Sunday, they're going to hell. Uh And the parents are 911 operators. They have to work on the weekends, and the child has no way to get to Mass. Right. Now, I wonder, I, I think the first two commandments are the most important. It's, it's, I think, I think that. But, I mean, I know it is a commandment, remember the Sabbath, but it would, in your opinion, would the child be going to hell? Okay, a couple things. Uh, I think it would be a good idea to find out more precisely what the priest said. Sometimes, um, you know, children don't always pick up precisely, uh, and sometimes they don't pick up nuances of what an adult says. So find out what the priest actually said. But what here would be the case, that in normally that attend, getting to Mass on Sunday is a, an obligation, and willfully missing Mass on Sunday is a mortal sin, okay? So that's, that's you're telling the, the, the truth on that. But if you cannot get there, then you don't have an obligation to be there. So, for instance, uh, there are people, like you mentioned, uh, uh, 911 workers who are essential workers. This is not, you know, making sure there's enough hamburgers at the local uh, fast food joint. Now, this is an essential deal, and, you know, of course, if your whole family depends on your, your living, um, you may have to be at the local fast food joint. But it's something that uh, they, you know, if they can go on a Saturday night, then they have an obligation to go on Saturday. If there's an earlier Mass that they can get to, they have an obligation to get there. But if they cannot, and again, a lot of these 911 workers are on 12-hour shifts, and or, or even more in some cases, like with firemen and such, and they cannot get to Holy Mass. If they cannot, then they are not under the obligation. They should do everything they could to get there. And their children who cannot get to church are not under that obligation. Now, if you get a chance to talk to one of those priests, one of the young fellows, um, I would say to them, you know, help to make those distinctions that, uh, for instance, someone who is sick is not obliged to go to Mass, or somebody like a mom who is caring for a sick person is not obligated to go either. If they cannot get there because they can't leave the sick person, then the the Sunday obligation doesn't apply. But in the normal circumstance that you can get there, you should go. If you live across the street, you don't have an excuse. But if you cannot get there, then you don't have the obligation. And I would talk to the priest to help make that clarification so they understand, the kids understand more clearly and don't have unnecessary guilt. Okay? That would be my suggestion. All right, we have Denise in the great state of Maryland. What can we do for you, Denise? Hi, Father Rich. I have a question. Yeah, what do you have? Uh, I'm Catholic. Well, a family member might want to go to confession, but mm-hmm. she's not Catholic. Can you mm-hmm. give me some advice to tell her? Here's what I would do. I would go to uh, you know, your uh, priest and set up an appointment because she, she probably wouldn't know what to do, but he could you know, definitely sit and talk with her, and depending on you know, some of her background and such, um, you know, I've heard the confessions of quite a number of Protestant ministers. 
Now, they didn't want sacramental absolution, but they definitely wanted to, you know, to, to tell somebody, and they trusted me. <laughs> A couple of them even said, oh, I know that if I tell you, it won't go any farther. And so, you know, they're right. I never said anything uh, to anybody about what they confessed. Um, and, you know, ask your priest, to get, get, get one that would be willing to just sit and talk with her and help her with that. And if nothing else, he can definitely pray with her and help her to seek the forgiveness. She may become interested in becoming Catholic, but even if not, he can still talk to her. And we, we priests are accustomed to talking to lots of non-Catholics. So that's what I would do. But make it a separate appointment rather than going to at the regular confession time because it might be, um, you know, take a little bit more extra care to help her through that. That would be my recommendation. And then I have an email from Ukraine. Uh, hi from Ukraine. How do you deep with, de how do you cope with spiritual desolation? This is something that Mother Teresa of Calcutta, now St. Teresa of Calcutta, had dealt with for years. She had uh, lots of spiritual dryness. Uh, for, and in the midst of desolation, there are a couple things to do. First, look back on previous times of spiritual consolation. Remember those. The evil spirit wants you to forget the times of consolation. He wants you only to remember things that go bad. And this is uh, something that would be very important to do. And secondly, don't allow the desolation to sway you from regular uh, committed spiritual practices, going to divine liturgy and saying your daily prayers. Even if you don't feel anything, don't let that stop you. Keep on being faithful to this spiritual discipline that you have. And then, you know, focus on, uh, as a matter of fact, what we'll be talking about next week. Go and imagine yourself with our Lord in Gethsemane. Picture yourself kneeling next to him at that rock. And just, even if you're silent, be silent with him. Like Job's friends should have been silent with him. And... Spend that time with Christ in Gethsemane as a way to find Him meeting you in the midst of that difficult desolation. Okay? That'd be my recommendation, Yaroslav. Lord bless you and all the people of Ukraine and Russia to find God and His peace. And the Lord bless all of you so that you may know the peace that only Christ can give and his healing. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And we ask you to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill because this network is brought to you by you. And so we need that support so that we can pay all of our bills too. God bless you and thank you.